Next, we have Dr. John Mamarian, who is the Director of Nuclear Cardiology and Cardiac CT at Houston Methodist DeBakey Heart and Vascular. Okay, let's see. Okay, so we're going to talk about the nuts and bolts of uh, doing CTA. And the first thing I want to emphasize is that, you know, our team is extremely important. And as you can see, over the years, we're now up to about 4,000 CTAs and about over 5,000 calcium scores. So without our ancillary staff and our nurses and our techs, we would be in uh, deep, deep trouble. So it all starts uh, with your systems, understanding your equipment, the uh, strengths and weaknesses. Uh, initially, we started off with a, with a brilliant system, which is shown here. It was a relatively slow system and uh, obviously had very uh, poor temporal resolution. I went to a Philips 64, and now we're, we have two four systems. And it's important that you know and get trained on these systems and that we train our technologists on all the ins and outs of these kind of devices. It's also important to define your protocols, both in writing and within the CT system itself. You can set up protocols within the CT based on the procedures you do. And that's extremely important because we do a lot of variety of procedures. We do EP procedures, we do congenital heart disease, we do valve service, we have a lot of TAVR and, and TMVRs, both pre and post procedure. We do a lot of cardiovascular surgery and have a lot of different uh, vascular uh, issues that need to be addressed by physicians, and we have heart failure, and we also have just general cardiologists. So, and actually, our coronary business is one of our smaller businesses uh, in terms of what we do. Uh, older systems, like our 64 slice scanner that we had before, were all pretty much retrospective systems with dose modulation, using at times prospective if we get away with it, if the heart rates were low enough, and if we had already given like 200 milligrams of beta blockers. Nowadays, we have faster systems, like our four systems, where we really don't require much in the way of beta blockade. We have very high pitch systems. We have low radiation exposure. And we can do different procedures in different patients, depending on uh, what the issues are. This is just an example of a prospective adaptive sequential imaging uh, procedure in someone with atrial fibrillation. You can see the heart rate varied from 54 to 139. Uh, it's, it was, the imaging was done over the uh, T wave, and you can see the study is absolutely beautiful using this kind of procedure, motionless image because of the high uh, temporal resolution of the system. This is an example of someone uh, with valvular heart disease where they specifically were asked to look at the, at the mechanical aortic valve. You can see it's not moving properly. We did a 20 to 80 phase procedure on this patient. And this is now after treatment, and you can see the valve is moving much better, except for the one leaflet which is frozen due to panis formation. And you can see in this patient they had clot pre, and then they received thrombolytic therapy, and the clot went away, and you saw a marked improvement. So it's very important to be able to determine, you know, what procedure you're doing for each individual patient, and that includes also uh, our TAVR protocols. Another important point is recognizing patients uh, are different, and they have different uh, size, age, gender, heart rate and blood pressure issues. Image quality is also extremely important, but so is radiation, and we always use the Alara principles and, and push those, and adjusting our KVs and MAs accordingly. And we recognize that there are a lot of different issues with contrast, too, which your technologists need to be trained on and understand the differences in terms of imaging right versus left-sided structures, visualizing shunts, uh, issues of contrast timing, especially in low ejection fraction patients, rates of administration, et cetera. This is just an example of, why, of why, where you might not want to see RV uh, in, in enhancement. This is a patient with a patent frame in Ovalley. This is someone with a PFO was shunt. This is someone who had actually an atrial septal puncture, and you can see there's left to right shunting. This is someone with a secundum ASD, where the best way to see left to right is not to have contrast on the right side. And this is where timing becomes important. So this is a patient with atrial fibrillation, where you can see on the initial images, there's, there's clot, and there appears to be clot in the left atrial appendage. And on the delayed image, you see the same. Okay, so timing and where you have contrast, extremely important. Another example, this is a patient with, uh, atrial, with uh, endocarditis who had actually a fistula between the left atrium and the LV. Uh, this patient, in terms of procedure, we, we did all the phases to look at different structures, including the mitral valve, the, 
the bioprosthetic mitral valve, which was normal. We also wanted to look at the tricuspid valve. In this particular case, so you see contrast on the right side, and you can see that the leaflets are not coapting properly. And you can see that on, on a dynamic study in terms of reflux of contrast into the uh, hepatic veins. This patient also had assessment of the aortic valve. During a contrast study, you can see there's AS and AI. And uh, we also looked at, at LV function. So you can see both left and right ventricular function are assessed here. So again, when you're doing studies, it's very important that you specify and you deal with your technologies in terms of what kind of procedure you're going to do and what you're actually looking for. OK, another thing is uh, absolutely making sure that there's very close physician interaction with staff. It's absolutely critical. You're not off the hook even if you, uh, if you, if you, um, if you give all these protocols and everything. We still protocol 90% of all our studies with our technologists and nurses to make sure we do the proper procedure in the proper patient. And we also provide uh, monthly schedules, and, and they all have our numbers in terms of being able to get in touch with us on a moment-to-moment on -moment basis if they need advice on a particular study. We also have schedule a monthly quality assurance meetings to go over uh, difficult cases with both fellows and technologists so that everyone kind of gets up to speed in terms of where we could have done better in terms of improving uh, uh, the uh, quality of our images. And we train our technologists not just to perform images, but also to interpret them. Because the best way to know if a study is good when you acquire it is to actually look at that image and read it, OK? So all of our technologists uh, pre-read calcium score studies, and they're, and they're ongoing learning how to pre-process all contrast studies. And uh, we usually have them do uh, multi-planar reconstructions on the coronaries or bypass grafts if, they, if patients have those, or in patients with stents to really kind of get uh, them, uh, them into processing studies and, and being able to see the quality of what they do. We also have templates for all of our, of all of our procedures, uh, CTAs, TAVR studies, carotids, uh, runoffs, all of them, uh, in which they technologists pre-populate the coronary data, they pre-populate all of the uh, structural data, including the aorta, et cetera. And this, again, allows them and us to interact together uh, to better understand how they're, how they're working and, um, and how good they're actually, uh, they're able to actually interpret uh, different findings on a, on a CT study. So in conclusion, uh, it really all starts with the technologists and how you train them. Importantly, know your equipment, define your protocols, individualize all of your patient procedures with your technologists, communicate with staff, and we do this on a case-by-case on -case basis. Engage in regular quality assurance meetings. And train your technologists just, not just to perform studies, but also interpret them, which will en enable them to understand better and better uh, what a good study is and how to avoid uh, uh, procedural issues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. McMahon. Okay, next up is uh, Dr. Daniel uh, Berman, who will be speaking on building a calcium score program, challenges and opportunities. And I can't think of anybody better than Dan to talk about that. How do you advance this page now? Oh, escape. <laughs> Okay, I'm talking about <coughs> building a calcium program, uh, challenges and opportunities, uh, no disclosures relevant. So when we think about coronary calcium scanning, it's a very pow powerful test. It's a marker of atherosclerosis. You see it, the patient has it. It's an integrated lifetime effect of all risk factors, uh, overcomes limitations of risk scores, and improves risk stratification, low dose, uh, very rapid studies, easily can do in 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, this is from Matt Budoff, classic slide, 25,000 patients early on in the 
mortality risk according to calcium scores for every increase in calcium, even from zero to one, there's an increase in risk. And with a score of three, th 300 at 10 times mortality risk, consistent findings in multiple large registries in all population-based studies. So guidelines have now accepted these calcium scanning. It's been there since 2010 and recently has even become more powerful in the 2018 cholesterol guidelines where it's become integrally in involved. In the patients who have a 7.5% to 20% risk of having 10-year uh, cardiovascular events, uh, treatment uh, guidelines are, uh, uh, are, uh, are, there are class one uh, indications for uh, uh, for treatment in that m intermediate risk group, but sometimes we don't know exactly what to do. And our patients don't want to take the statins or the doctors don't know whether to put them on. So inside these guidelines are actually specific recommendations about what should be done uh, with calcium scanning. And that's achieved now a uh, very high level of recommendation within guidelines. Uh, so calcium scanning for primary prevention reduces unnecessary treatment. We get people with zero scores off of therapy when needed, and it guides the intensity of treatment. A very valuable test. This is our uh, study of the Cedars-Sinai, 34,000 patients from 1998 until the present time. And we see we started off with a bang when it first came out. Uh, we, uh, uh, and then it gradually, over the next 10 years, uh, fell off over time. But then in around 2010, as the guidelines now became adopted and said, this is a valuable test, then it went up. And it went up dramatically and it still continues to rise. So bottom line, challenge and opportunity, simple talk, buy a scanner, hire a tech, and open the door. <laughs> Thank you. No, no, I'm not actually. <laughs> Not actually stop, uh, stopping. Okay, the scanner. It is very important. Uh, it's said that you can do it with uh, a half second rotation. This on the right is a slide at half second rotation. And what you see, particularly in the right coronary, on the top is a star pattern uh, where you get counting doubly. You really have inaccurate scores. Uh, and it's uh, uh, certainly not a good uh, image to show your, your colleagues. Uh, Less than three, uh, a third of a second rotation time is what would be recommended. And from that, you can get very high quality studies. Uh, when you're doing the testing, recommend getting a basic questionnaire uh, that would uh, allow you to incorporate all the information into your report. And then scan, of course, with a standardized protocol that is an accepted protocol uh, following the SCCT guidelines. Have a flexible schedule. It's a very rapid study, so if it's needed, just do it. Just say yes is what we tell our technologists. And then be sure to test the right patients. The patients at intermediate risk could go down instead of 7.5%, go down to 5% to 20% likely of having coronary disease. But don't scan patients who have known disease. We're really not going to be helpful with this uh, uh, early uh, preventive test because we know that they're going to have calcification. And we should think about it not as a screening test. This is a concept put forth by uh, uh, Mort Nagavi in the SHAPE uh, uh, Guidelines uh, SHAPE Society group, now being presented to Medicare as a diagnostic test after screening. We screen with risk factor assessment and find that likelihood of coronary disease by the ASCVD risk score. And then after you know that they are intermediate risk, then we perform the diagnostic test. And that's helpful in getting payers to buy in. Then we have to get the word out. Inform your referring physicians and the NPs and the PAs, the, uh, P P the primary care providers. It's now part of their literature. It's part of what they're standardly applying when the patient in the right age group comes in, in the door. You could consider having conferences that you either present at or having a visiting expert. Educational p uh, materials for patients are very useful and for, and for uh, physicians. And you could consider if you're really starting up and you want to grow the program rapidly, social media and public me media and talking to interested patient groups. But we have to remember, test the right patients. 
You can develop these brochures. Brochures are very helpful, I think, in, because patients talk to one another. And having something like this is, uh, is helpful. You can get them easily. This is just taken from the internet. There are so many pictures of people's brochures and even PowerPoint presentations that you could download and use for presentations. You could even start talking about in very effective tools to convince patients. This is a very well done movie as far as I'm concerned. Uh, except for perhaps uh, dumping too much on the interventionalists for the way they cat the supposedly stint too many people. But it's a very good, relatively up-to-date uh, document that can be helpful in talking to people about the value of the program. When you make a report, it's important that the, result, that the report can actually change outcomes. Uh, you follow SCCT recommendations, there's a nice uh, CAD uh, CAC uh, uh, diagnostic reporting system uh, by the Society of Cardiovascular CT, rec uh, led by Harvey Hecht. Uh, make your report easily readable, comprehensive. Make sure you have the calcium score and percentile. Look at extravascular calcification, aortic size, and incident uh, other findings uh, such as the number of plaques and uh, 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 that it, that can be looked at. Uh, call the doctors with the unusual reports and incidental findings and report quickly. We find that a valuable addition is to tell patients and physicians where their patients sit on the spectrum of, uh, of their, uh, compared to others in this uh, age, gender, and ethnicity uh, 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 percentile is, is a very useful uh, addition. And then there's treatment guidelines. If we don't recommend what to do with the studies, we're going to have much less effect than we otherwise might. This is taken from the uh, uh, work of, uh, the, of the group under HECT that was published in JCCT in 18 that shows the level of risk associated with each calcium score category and then the treatments that are recommended based on them. And notice there's even a treatment recommendation for patients with very low scores, particularly if they're at higher risk. So this is based on the, you base the treatment recommendation on the risk of the disease versus the risk of treatment, and uh, Kurram Nasser has really nicely documented the, the value of that approach. A sample report could also be obtained uh, if you wanted to have a good startup document. So I would say the essentials are make sure you use a high quality scanner with sufficient rotation speed. Uh, when they come in for service, be pleasant experience with the technology is very important. Prompt, easy, complete reporting with guidance statements. Make sure the price is low enough. Uh, don't overprice this study and get the word out. Exponential growth is likely in asymptomatics, similar to that that is going to be seen in CCTA in symptomatic patients. And that's why I could actually have left the slide at that first part, which is buy a scanner, uh, buy a scanner, hire a tech, and open the doors. It's a major opportunity to add to your service. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dan. That was wonderful. We'll do the Q&A towards the end. Um, and next, we're shifting from calcium scoring to CTA. And that is not push-button technology, as we know. And you don't have to settle for a bad scan. Often, you can fix it. And uh, Quint Trung is somebody who is a master at um, acquisition and fixing things that aren't perfect to begin with. Quint? Thank you, Sunny. Well, I learned most of my tips and tricks from Sunny Abara and Stefan Achenbach. So if anything is wrong, blame them. Okay, so this, um, this talk is about CTA acquisition tips and tricks. Obviously, with um, cardiac scans, there's multitudes of uh, other indications, but we'll just focus on coronaries today. Uh, my disclosure. So I'm going to go through 10 tips for the best image quality and interpretation. I'll break it up into three stages. The first is patient preparation. The second is image acquisition. And the third is post-processing. Okay. So tip number one, you need to practice that breath hold. As you can see here, 
Um, the best way to know if there's respiratory artifact is just to put um, your line through the sternum and look for sternum break. Sternum or skin break, okay? So this we don't really see that much anymore. This is so many of these breaks. This is because this is probably done in retrospective. Okay, but to avoid that, there's really no way of fixing this once it's acquired. So if patients are breathing through your study or let an air escape, there's no way of preventing it. You can't fix it with any ECG changes or anything. So just prevent it from happening in the first place. So what, we can, what can we do to avoid this? So why this happens is the scanner, as it's acquiring, is moving through. So if the patient is holding the breath, but letting a little air escape, you're gonna get jumped because this is axial sequential imaging, okay? And then you're gonna have these little breaks, and then here you can see the skin break, okay? So patient preparation. So I always have the text go watch the patient breathe and watch and make sure that diaphragm is not moving, and you say do not let any air escape. Because even though people are holding the breath, what they do is they hold and they let go a little bit. And that's gonna hurt your image quality, okay? So here is an example. This is um, a, a, um, a 64 slice scanner where you see a little skin break here and sternal break here. This is the typical of what we see now because we do pro um, prospective axial sequential scanning. Um, here, right here, because of that, we have, we can't really interpret this RCA. This is probably clean, right? But we don't know because it looks like this. We repeated the scan and we um, told them, do not let any air escape. And look at how nice this is here. Our RCA looks like this, and we have beautiful RCA images, okay? So then you can say like, okay, great, there's no disease there. Okay, my second tip is to give nitrates to vasodilate. Your nurses may be scared, some institution may not wanna give it, you should give it, okay? Give it until, unless they're hypotensive. So my rule is if the blood pressure is above 100, you can give one. Above 110, you give two nitrates, okay? So here's an example of a case right here. This is okay, but right here in the mid-LAD, this is a little bit tight. I don't know, is it moderate lesion? Who knows? They didn't give nitrates. I was a bit annoyed, so I told them, you know, you guys screwed up. You guys should have given nitrates, call the patient back. And we rescan with nitrates on board and look at how nice this open. So this is mild disease on two nitrates, okay? So important to give nitrates, especially if the patient is not hemodynamically um, hypotensive. Obviously our rule is if um, the blood pressure is low under 100, we don't give because we don't want to cause harm, okay? And really the only issue is if they have no disease, is not a problem. No disease, not a problem. Um, if they have plaque, your, your specificity for stenosis reading may be a little bit compromised. That's the only difference. Okay, tip number three, slow that heart rate, okay? I don't care what scanner you have. You have single source, dual source, dual source with like big gantry, single source with large detectors. I can't give you the names of them, but you know what I'm talking about. These advanced scanners, you still should block, okay? Um, optimally, you like to have the heart rate less than 63, but sometimes with the newer scanners, you don't. Older scanners, I like to say the single source 64 slice scanner, I'd like to be under 65 beats per minute. If it's a single source volumetric scanner, where it's 256 or 320 slice, I like to be under 70, and same as the dual source. I like to be under 70. Not the end of the world if you can't reach that because there are other modes to scan, but it's usually at a cost of higher radiation. So if you look at, at the RCA through the cardiac cycle, you'll see that there's sweet spots, 70%, 80% usually are the sweet spot where it's motion free. And there's also a systolic phase right here, usually 30, 35, 40, 45% where it's also motion free. We can do retro and open up the whole thing, but that's a lot of radiation and you don't want to do that. Or you could even open your padding to 35% to 80%, but I only do that if I have to, okay? But otherwise, if you could slow the heart rate down, you could basically get it right here about 70 to 80 percent and you'll have motion free images. Okay, so this is how I acquire tip number four. I acquire multiple phases with padding, okay? It's nice in the um, high pitch scanner, you could do single bead acquisition, but the problem with that is if you have a stenosis, you have nothing else to go and compare to. You don't know if that's artifact, if it's noise, or if it's real plaque. So I like, you know, the dose penalty is not very high. I like to have a little padding on each side um, to see if the stenosis is real versus artifact. So if the patient is slow with 
with a regular heart rate, I prefer to scan diastolic percentage acquisition 70 to 80 percent depending on your scanner or 68 to 73 percent depending on your scanner. This one is reserved for the slower um, single source scanner. This one is reserved for the dual source scanner. Okay. Now what if you already block the patient and we at our institution we give a dose of Metopa 100 or 50 up front and then we may rescue with 5 IV, et cetera. Um, but you do that and still fast, or the patient has irregular heart rate. Not the end of the world. I still take them. I take every case that comes in, because you don't want to be one of those no, no, no people, because then they'll just send it to other institutions, like mine. OK, so um, if the heart rate is fast or irregular, you can scan during um, systolic and diastolic image acquisition. Basically, you will open the window of acquisition to 35 to 80%. So you're going to have a 70 to 80%, you're going to have that 35 to 45% for the fast heart rate, OK? If, um, if you have one of the dual source scanner, what you can do is you can actually save radiation and just forget the diastolic image acquisition, and you could do what's called absolute systolic millisecond acquisition. So after the R wave, I scan at 250 to 400 milliseconds, and I reconstruct at 50 millisecond interval. Usually the sweet spot for these scanners is going to be 300 to 350 milliseconds, where you're going to see motion-free Im images. But I do the 250 and 400 anyways just to be safe. Okay, so here's an example. Um, here is a case right here, 350. You see this um, LED lesion right here. It looks like there is potential plaque. Well, I just shifted one phase over to 300, and you can see this is widely open, right? Just minimal disease. So if there's a stenosis that you see, you need to confirm it in two phases, OK? If it goes away, it's not a stenosis, it's artifact, OK? And that's why it's, it's beneficial for you to do um, acquire multiple phases with padding. OK, so with tip number five. Consider systolic um, scanning for irregular heartbeats, like AFib. So here's an AFib case. The rate's pretty slow. Um, and basically what we do is we scan absolute milliseconds after the R wave, 200 to 400 milliseconds. Okay, it's prospective axial, but it's an absolute fix. The reason why you don't want to do percentage is because the R to R variable is changing. So if you do 70 to 80%, the R to R interval for each beat is going to be different. When, so when you align the images up, you know, your four beats, it's going to be misaligned. Okay, so if you do the absolute, then it will line up. So here's an example of this case, scan at 350. Um, well, it's scan at 250 to 4. 400, but here's the 350 milliseconds of the RCA, beautiful AFib case. Okay. So what about fast heart rates? Okay, so fast heart rate with a single source scanner, well, if the heart rate's in the 70s, 70s or 80s or whatever, you're not too happy, but you've already blocked them. You don't want to take them off the table, right? So what you can do is you could open your window acquisition and include a third, the systolic images, like the 35%. So this would be acquired at 35 to 80%. So here's the 80%. You can see motion in this RCA right here. I don't know. It looks like maybe it's non-calcified plaque. Maybe not. But look at this. At 40% during systole, clean. Okay, so that's the benefit of that. Okay, tip number six. Um, consider scanning caudal crany, especially for cabbage cases. This is me, okay? Like, anyone who scans like this, they know this is my scan. And, and I do this for almost every patient. Here is the lima right here. And then you see, like, mixing artifact coming down this way because you're scanning crany caudal, okay? If you scan caudal crany, by the time it gets up here, you're able to actually see your vessel, okay? One of the benefits of scanning um, caudal crany is then, you know, um, you scan at the bottom. So basically, Typically, if you run out of contrast, you're going to run out of contrast at the bottom, right? You scan top down, and the, the PDA is usually the smallest, and sometimes you can't tell what's going on. So I scan bottom up because, you know, that left main is quite large. So even if you run out of contrast, you're able to see that left main, and typically you're at the PA at that time already. So I like that. And also, then the RCA, um, the right side is washed out, and then you can look at your PD, um, PFO, et cetera. Okay, tip number seven, use high contrast rate. Oh, I'm a little bit over time. I'm almost done. Okay. Um, high contrast rate, rate, five, six, seven cc's per second. I use a, a simplified for my tech BMI and weight um, based protocol. 
Um, you know, it improves the contrast to noise ratio, for, especially for a distal vessel. You could do this, but don't hit PSI. Your techs need to know what the, ski, what the IV can do. There's no point in doing a test bolus, and there's no point in doing all these calculations and giving high dose of contrast when you're going to hit PSI. PSI is um, pound second inch. And basically what that does is once you hit PSI, because the machine does not want that, um, that IV to explode, it's just going to slow down to whatever rate it wants. Okay. So now for here, the contrast is all on the right side because it's slowed down. And now you can't even see the distal RCA. And this is the image that it had. So we basically rescanned right here with a slower um, rate. And look at how beautiful we see the images, okay? So do not hit PSI. Um, tip number seven, contrast, give enough volume. I'm not gonna go through this because of, because of time, but you should, know how to, um, you should know how to know how to calculate your contrast volume. We do a very tight contrast volume. Um, let me just move this. Okay, but don't run out of contrast, okay? I scan bottom up, like I said, right here. We scan bottom up for whatever reason. So if you want to see if your contrast is running out, put that, that line through the, the, through the descending aorta and you can see how homogenous it is. Here you can see that we ran out of contrast. So look it up here. That's bad. The text somehow did not do that math right. We rescan using the right amount of contrast, and it looks like this. So now this lesion right here in the LAD is just mild or minimal disease. Tip number eight, RV opacification for function. Really, if you need, I like to do a tight bolus for my LV because I don't like contrast. This is how I like it. I don't like contrast in my, in my RV, RA. I like to see my PFO. I like this to, my RCA to be just like, you know, by itself, beautiful, clean. So if for whatever reason your, your, your referring wants function, the difference between RV and LV is 10 seconds for most patients, okay? We did this triple rule out tr um, trial and we we're doing all these fancy, oh, put the ROI over the um, pulmonary artery and this and do the subtraction all. Anyways, 10 seconds. So all you have to do is you just have to add 10 seconds of contrast to your original contrast, okay? So if your original contrast for coronary is, say, 75 or 55 per, up front, use that for 100% so this is nicely opacified, and then you could do a 50-50 mixture of 10 seconds. So that's like at 5 cc's per second, it's 50 ml. And, oops. Oh yeah, so here you can see now that it's a, a little bit opacified this way. Um, two more tips, okay? Use a hard kernel when you're dealing with um, calcium. So here is a calcium. There's, um, this is all set on your scanner. This is just a medium convoluted kernel. And all I did was change the kernel to a hard kernel. And now you can see through the calcium, okay? You probably have to do a little windowing, but that's about it. One of the other things you could do is you could hone in for the field of view, which is tip number nine. Use a harder kernel and a smaller field of view to improve your spe spatial resolution, especially with stents. So here's the field of view of 19. You can see this right here. It's a medium kernel, standard um, slice thickness with 50% overlap. What you do is you tell your tech to hone in the field of view to a smaller field of view of 12, change it to a harder kernel. Now you can minimize your slice thickness instead of 0.75 down to 0.65 with 50% overlap, and you'll get better improved spatial resolution at the expense of noise. But now you can see through this. I don't know if you really get you know, much benefit if you hone it down even more to, um, to a field of view of seven. I think I can see it pretty well here and here. Um, the only difference here is the field of view. But remember, hone in the field of view, make the slice thickness thinner, and change the kernel to a hard kernel for your stent and for your calcium, okay? My last, my last tip is know your post-processing software. Know where this lab is. This is one of the scanners, and basically you see this right here, right? Um, and this is what it looks like. It came like that. So, well, there are certain algorithms in the scanner that you could change where you could actually should see the lines here. So this right here is actually just a slab, okay? This is just where the slab is. So the original software itself, what it did was it interpolated and it volume average these two slices so that you don't see it, okay? But then this is actually may artificially cause a stenosis, okay? So always look, if you have a stenosis that looks like this, always look at your actual raw data. 
And the last one is no other, your other post-processing software. There are some out there. If the temporal resolution isn't great because you don't have a dual source scanner or whatever, um, there are methods of improving temporal resolution. Here it uses two, um, three data sets 80 milliseconds apart like this. And this is what it looks like. And it merges to look like this. So the algorithm is able to merge and look like this. This is all part of the um, post-processing software. And with that, I'd like to thank you. Sorry, I went over the Thank you so much, Dr. Chung. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Sunny Abar from UT Southwestern. He'll be talking to us about image interpretation and reading like a pro. Thank you very much. So uh, that was fantastic. There's a, a number of things I heard. First of all, these that slab blurring, edge blurring artifact, that works great in photo stitch software. That's when you had the super wide pictures with your digital camera. But it's terrible if you have it turned on on your scanner. It comes defaulted, turn it off. Figure out uh, where the button is, or have your vendor come in and turning it off. Then I heard beta blocker reminds essential, no matter what the vendors tell you, I fully agree. You get the best images with that. Um, although with some of the faster scanners, you can scan some patients where that may be contraindicated. And lastly, do not tolerate bad image quality. Often there's something you have to figure out, is it the kind where we can do something about it or not? Um, most important really for interpretation, my topic, is that you have great data. Um, because it's that garbage in, garbage out uh, principle. If you are a great interpreter of images and you have garbage images, your result will be garbage. Um, likewise, if, if you don't know what you're doing, that's perhaps not, uh, not a good thing either. Um, so you have to know what you're doing, but um, you can't be good or brilliant unless your data are brilliant. So what Dr. Trung just discussed was really important, but it also is part of your uh, interpretation. So you have to optimize uh, patient selection and preparation. Uh, beta blocker nitro is part of that. You have to choose the optimal patient protocol. We just heard a bunch about it. Do your EKG editing, do your data reconstruction, and then you think you're into the reading room, but really um, you have to go back and forth. You're the only one who will know whether or not something potentially is an artifact. Before you interpret a lesion, you gotta know that it's not artificial. Um, we've seen a few examples, I'll show you one too. So you will have to be ready to go back to the scanner and re-reconstruct the data with every single case you reconstruct. And then, of course, for interpretation, we can scroll through the images um, up and down axially like so. We all know how to do it. Um, you do multiplanar reformations. I do them uh, manually. You can do curved multiplanar reformations. Uh, uh, and MIP images, all of that exists. And there was an early study that uh, we did when I still was at MGH and Marsh Ferencik was the first author, Stefan Achenbach was the senior author on that, looking at all of these different things. You know, the curved MPR, very popular today, but boy, 7% of these will be non-evaluable studies. Uh, so you gotta be careful. It introduces additional artifacts. Um, of course, nobody, I hope, in this room is trying to make stenosis interpretation of 3D or of curved MIPS. They can help and give you incremental information, so I do use them, but you have to be ready to make your diagnosis of the axial uh, images and MPRs because they will tell you the whole story. Everything else has less information. It may look like it has more, but it has less information. It eliminates some information. So what are these reasons for null availability? We all know them. It's a lot of calcium or stents. Um, and then the question is, well, can we do a sharper kernel or thinner slices? As we have seen, it worked in some of Quinn's cases. It doesn't always work, of course. It will not work in this case. Um, and then there's motion artifact or arrhythmia-related artifacts. And the question here is, can you do EKG editing? So here's my example. Um, Looking at this case, it's labeled misregistration, so you probably noticed there's a stenosis, right? Boy, the lighting here is really not good, but I hope you can see it anyway. Um, well, if you look at the MPR images, yeah, if you could make it a little bit darker, especially towards the screen, that'd be great. And you can see that this is really artificially straightly sh cut off uh, at the top. Um, a short axis image at the same location shows you also the disc is kind of cut into half. 
Um, if you do some EKG editing and re reconstruct the same data set, patients gone, suddenly there is absolutely no stenosis. So you basically move the anatomy a little bit uh, into the slab, and this pseudostenosis is gone. So the 3D side by side shows you that. So you have two choices when you recognize this as an artifact. As one is put your arms in the air, say artifact, and say I can't interpret non-evaluable, or um, you fix it. Hopefully you will first have recognized that this is a, an artifact and not real. Once you have made sure that what you're looking at is real and you have the optimal images, you have to de decide on the stenosis degree. And this, from the first guideline from Dr. Gil Raff, uh, the gold medal recipient this year here at SCCT, um, uh, this was one of the classifications we had. Uh, basically, the f top two are less than 50% luminal narrowing. These are non-evaluable. And then you would have a moderate uh, that's potentially obstructive and then severe or occlusion. You do this for every single segment of the 17-segment uh, uh, model of the SCCT. You report. So here's, here's where I'm careful with my trainees because they always mix up the semi-quantitative part, so this, the plug and the stenosis part. I like two separate sentences to help them separate that. Sometimes people say there's a moderate lesion in the LED, and I just don't know what they mean. Is it a moderate amount of mixed or non-calcified plug, or is it moderate luminal narrowing? So we make it two separate sentences to help people semi-quantitatively assess the amount of plug and the type, calcified, non-calcified, partially calcified, and the degree of stenosis, which can only be non-evaluable, non-mild, moderate, severe, or occlusion. Okay, and um, in addition, we uh, uh, determine whether there is plug vulnerability, and I think you're all familiar with that. The important ones are um, spotty calcification, positive free modeling, the napkin ring sign, and low attenuation. There are, of course, others, not all of which uh, uh, are easily imaged with uh, routine CT. Of course, positive free modeling is a large adventitial diameter of the lesion compared to the proximal and distal reference average. And this is a, a calcified plug, spotty calcification, less than three millimeters, um, and coarse calcification. Then what is really important is once you've gone through all these 17 segments, being careful to have the two answers for each segment, you'd have to look at everything else. Um, the valves, we've seen some, some nice cases of the atria, some shunts there. That all is part of your diagnosis, and sometimes the symptoms lie elsewhere in the myocardium or in, in, in the ventricles, the pericardium, the great vessels, and sadly, everything else outside of the heart, we have to look at that too, because there is a lot of information and we are liable for that. That is difficult though, and uh, there is a lot of uncertainty, and in 2005, in the first, uh, was it, five or six, so first SCCT meeting, or the last um, meeting before SCCT happened at the National Society for Cardiac CT, there was a big debate on that, whether or not we should be looking or completely ignoring everything else. And um, this is one of the papers uh, we did early on, looking at the first, uh, or 400 consecutive, not the first, uh, EDCTA patients, um, where we found a lot of incidental findings, a lot of meaningless ones uh, in nearly half of the patients, but we had a very rigorous chart review and we had an adjudication by two physicians um, to see whether or not this information was known and whether it was, uh, it did impact the patient's clinical management. Most incidental findings papers didn't have that rigorous analysis. So what we found that it did change in hospital management in only 1.3%. So that would be something like a pneumonia that was unknown, which is actually the cause of the chest pain or a PE. Um, an alternative diagnosis was provided in 4.1% uh, when the coronaries were excluded, but sadly it led to 20% of follow-up imaging. Most of them were for pulmonary nodules. There's lots of details in the study I don't want to bother you with. But it is somewhat of a reality we're facing. If we do look, we will have that is uh, considered a downstream cost uh, from CT. Um, and it turns out, uh, you know, these 81 patients, only two of them turned out to have cancer. There were some other important uh, uh, entities in there, but the follow-ups were mostly to rule out cancer. Three biopsies, uh, and two-thirds of them were positive. Um, so it, in total, um, you will have 20% of your patients will get follow-up scans, but only 5% of total patients will have important incidental findings. 
um, to the left and to the right are the two cancers we biopsied, and then in the middle that was just a muscular hypertrophy on biopsy, but um, there was an unnecessary biopsy here. And then you would uh, want to use the CADRATS uh, system, which standardizes the reporting. Um, on a per patient basis, you look at the highest degree stenosis throughout your coronary arteries. Uh, everything that's less gets more or less ignored. It doesn't look at the total plaque burden, uh, for example. And it provides specific uh, recommendations. Um, so let me just skip through this one here. This is uh, the CADRAT score. I hope you're all familiar with it. If not, um, I would recommend starting to use it. CADRAT 0, 1, and 2 is non-obstructive uh, coronary artery disease. Actually, 0 is no coronary artery atherosclerosis, I should say. 4 and 5 is obstructive, which is above 70. And then there's that category 3, 50 to 69, that is potentially obstructive. Perhaps a good one for FFRCT. Um, uh, to help uh, your, your patients out further. And then four is separated into single or two vessel disease versus 4B, which is three vessel or left main disease. So that's CADRATS in a nutshell. There are two tables. One is to be used in stable, one in acute chest pain, and they give you basically the stenosis degree, which is the same for both tables. But it, it tells you in a prose version what this is what it means, like ACS likely, and then it gives some clinical management guidance for each of these categories, and the guidance is different in the acute setting versus the chronic chest pain uh, setting. Um, just uh, a few examples. This is a CADRATS zero example. There's no pluck and no stenosis in all three vessels, and of course, its branches. You'd have to look at all 17 segments, as long as they are larger than 1.5 millimeters. Um, on the left, you have a CADRATS 1V. Uh, why is it 1? Well, it's less than 25% luminal narrowing, and you can see the spotty calcification, some low attenuation plug, and maybe some positive remodeling. So it's actually three out of the, uh, at minimum, two vulnerability criteria. And then CADRATS 2S, the modifier S is for the stent, and CADRATS 2 is for this just below 50% luminal narrowing. And on the right is an example of a CADRATS 3, where you have 50 to 69% uh, narrowing. Um, and um, uh, lastly, you have a, a, an example of a modifier G, where you have a lemur to LED, and then two uh, autocoronary saphenous vein grafts, um, giving you the, the uh, modifier G in this person. And here's a 4A, where you have single vessel disease, a significant stenosis, actually a couple significant stenosis in the same vessel. And then this would be a 4B, excuse me, 4B, because your left main is more than 50% narrowed. Um, I should mention that, of course, uh, uh, more than 50% is significant in the left main, where normally we use more than uh, 17 all other vessels. And this patient also happens to have a stent down there. And uh, lastly, an example of occlusion, that's a CADRATS 4B. Excuse me, yeah, 4B, thank you very much uh, for, excuse me, CADRATS 5, what am I saying? Why did you not protest? <laughs> it's so polite. <laughs> this is the CADRATS 5 because it's a complete occlusion. That was it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Barr, for that wonderful talk. Our next speaker is Dr. Ed Nichols, coming to talk to us about optimal cardiac CT reporting and comprehensive yet focused reports. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation. So I'm going to talk to you uh, about the optimal CT coronary angiogram report. And, and I'm going to focus on CT coronary angiography because in 10 minutes I can't really cover the optimal cardiac CT report because clearly there's a huge array of things that you might uh, be asked to report on. But I think the principles I'm going to outline are much the same. So I think the first thing to say is I think a lot of how you report depends on actually what your your internal model for reporting is. Most people do a dictation onto a template, usually uh, voice recognition onto a, a radiology information systems, but people do this different ways. Many centers it will be a single specialist, whether that be a cardiologist or a radiologist. Some will do a combined report uh, and a joint sign-off, and some uh, will do a dual read with a radiologist and cardiologist sat next to each other, but clearly that's uh, probably not a strongly economic uh, model for taking this forward. And some centres will review uh, challenging cases in a, in a multidisciplinary team environment. But the bottom line is, I think, you know, absolutely as a bare minimum, we must uh, include appropriate images that are archived to PACS to go along with that report, many of which you've seen from the previous talks. Um, so depending on what your reporting model is really important. And I think, again, I was having a chat with Jeff Carr uh, on the bus in Toronto a couple of weeks ago at a Siemens meeting. And we actually said to the point, it also depends on who you are reporting for. So in my institution, the majority of reports are to cardiologists, 
whereas obviously in other centres the majority of reports might be to ED physicians or surgeons or, or others and therefore how you tone your tone of your report may differ depending on who you are giving advice to and I think you know we need to understand what our referrers want and this does sometimes differ between different people uh, and their level of, of knowledge and understanding so for example a referral from a congenital heart disease specialist uh, with a CT scan you, you probably would report differently than a, an ED uh, individual reporting on, on a standard CT coronary angiogram. So again, what do they want? Now, you know, this is actually not a bad referral in my example because they've actually stated the examinations, plural, both a calcium score and a CT angio. They haven't said CT coronary angio, but I'm assuming because they're questioning coronary artery disease, that's what they want. But quite often we, as you know, any of those that do this, you will get questions that will just say query CAD, to which the answer is yes or no. Uh, that clearly isn't actually what they're asking. But actually, are they asking, you know, is there coronary artery disease that's likely to be causing this patient's symptoms, or are they asking, is there any coronary artery disease? And again, there is an element of us as reporters having to try and work out exactly what they mean. So let's start with the calcium score. Again, we've already had a talk on this, but I, just a couple of points I would say. Uh, there is the overall score, uh, and again, there's some very good data, obviously the MESA study and other large data showing outcome data. But actually, where the calcium is is also important. And again, we should do this as a vessel based as well as an overall score. And again, I think it's really important to also put uh, this data in terms of the age specific and gender specific guidelines because clearly the only normal calcium score is zero. Once you've got a calcium score of more than zero, you have got uh, coronary atheroma. Um, and again, one needs to be aware of the age. So the power of zero, and again, if you have a chat with Kurum Mazir and others, you know, if you're 65 and you've got a calcium score of zero, that's probably highly reassuring. If you're 25 with symptoms, it probably isn't as it because actually you're likely to have non-calcified plaque, which may well be causing your symptoms. And as Sonny and others have alluded to, SECT have come out with some careful guidelines, and I think the CAC DRS uh, system is very helpful. But again, I think you know, as a non-US speaker here, uh, clearly you know this is written for a, for a predominantly North American market, and again mindful of who is referring the patients in for this. So this may well be going back to family practitioners. And as I say, I think you just have to be a little bit careful in a report and be mindful. Uh, cardiologists particularly, and I say this as one of them, uh, don't like being told what to do as a general rule of thumb, and they can get a little bit prickly about it at times. So again, I think refining your way of actually telling people what to do without telling them what to do is a skill that I think is worth learning, and I think there are ways of doing that. If we move on and beyond coronary anatomy, clearly depending on how you acquire your scan, you may well have both anatomy and physiology if you've done a retrospective study. We've already talked about um, whether we put contrast in the left and the right hand side of the heart. And again, it very much goes back to uh, what you're trying to do. Sonny just very articulately described, you know, with the obstructive and the plaque morphology and this kind of data. And this is all really quite important. And I think actually, you know, a good report will encompass the multiple risk factors and give the referrer a very clear idea of exactly, you know, not just what the maximal stenosis is, but maybe the overall atheroma burden as well as the CADRAD score. And again, any functional data. And again, I would suggest also looking at things like the myocardium, particularly when there is disease, is the attenuation of the myocardium uh, essentially the same or are there areas of hypoattenuation? which might suggest either subendocardial or full thickness myocardial infarction. So again, Sonny's kind of covered this to a degree. Uh, I think the, you know, it's relatively straightforward. Again, we have the CAD rounds. I think I have a slight challenge with the term moderate, and Sonny has just articulated that. You know, what does moderate mean? And different people's view of the word moderate will change. So I use potentially flow limiting for 50 to 70% and probably flow limiting for greater than 70%. Um, and again, from, to my mind, and we come down to the next step, you know, what do the referrers want? They really want to know how do I treat this patient. They've got no coronary artery disease, that's fine. They've got non-obstructive coronary artery disease, but there is coronary artery disease, medical therapy, or they do have obstructive coronary artery disease or potentially obstructive coronary artery disease. Is there a reason to revascularize to improve symptoms or to improve prognosis? And they're really the only two reasons. And I think we need to be mindful uh, that you know the prognosis argument is a difficult one. Some people would say greater than 10% myocardial perfusion defect. The data, if you go back to the original study, actually it came strongly significant at 25%, uh, which is quite a lot of ischemia. And again, we just need to be mindful when we're looking at anatomic data sets, if we don't have the function, that just because there's a stenosis does not mean the patient needs to be revascularized and optical medical therapy may well be the answer. 
Again, Sonny's covered this to a greater degree, and again, I would absolutely concur that if you don't know this well, you should go and, and look it up, because actually I think it's a great marker. Now, whether you routinely use it in terms of stating a CADRAD score, I think is debatable. Clearly, if you are going to write a CADRAD score in your report and use that as a summary document, it's clearly absolutely critical your referrer knows what a CADRAD score is. So again, if you don't know the algorithm, it's a bit of a meaningless figure. But actually, I think the descriptive terms and the standardization that's been brought about because of this initiative is clearly very powerful and I think I would strongly support. And again, you know, should we, and I would argue we probably should, give some advice about what to do next. So obviously if there is no coronary disease or relative medical therapy, then that's okay. That's relatively straightforward to recommend and one would hope that uh, most referrers would say there is atheroma, therefore I will treat with at least a statin. We can have a bit of a debate about aspirin. Or actually, is there a potentially significant lesion? Do we need to go on and do some functional imaging to do, actually get ourselves more information? Sonny mentioned CTFFR, but of course you've got all the other non-invasive imaging modalities. And again, I think a lot of that depends on your local institution and what you are have access to. Or do you actually, if you think there's a, a significant stenosis, recommend a, an, an invasive coronary angiogram with query proceed? I do not think we should be referring on for uh, diagnostic angiography without actually listing the patient for a query proceed procedure, but actually also recognizing that CT, the positive predictive value of a CT scan means that some of these patients will go to the lab and will not on either eyeballing or FFR in the lab require a stent. And of course, if they've got multi-vessel disease, then actually that patient may need an angiogram prior to coronary artery bypass graft. But what I would also say is be bold, okay? Be careful with your wording, especially as I say to cardiology, but actually put your money where your mouth is. If you think it's a 70% lesion, say you think it's a 70% lesion. But also be careful when you're talking to your referrers and just make them aware of the fact that, you know, we have got technical limitations in terms of spatial and temporal resolution, and therefore actually this is not the same as an invasive angiogram, and that's an important message to give out to our referrers. And then the bane of uh, many people's lives, I think, um, you know, what do you do with the incidental findings? And again, as Sonny's just alluded to, you know, one needs to be careful. We do have an obligation to look at everything, and that's true of the cardiologist as well as the radiologist. To my mind, it's very easy as a cardiologist. Is it normal? Is it not normal? If it's not normal, go find a radiologist because they're trained to deal with these things. You know, we are not as cardiologists. You know, but you've got to look at the thoracic um, wide field of view. You've got to look at the non-thoracic uh, areas and the non areas. But what I would also suggest is actually, if you do enough of these, actually, you know, things that are abnormal jump out at you. You might not know what they are as a cardiologist particularly, but you can often pick up the fact that they are clearly not normal or not expected. And the final thing I would say, and I spend a lot of my time training both cardiology and radiology trainees, is if you find a significant finding, you know, notice if it's incidental of no clinical uh, relevance, okay? Be clear to the referrer whether it's clinically relevant or not and whether it needs some investigation. So don't write something like diverticulum of comoral. Because to many people, they'll sit there and go, well, what the hell is a diverticulum comoral and what am I supposed to do about it? You know, it's not something that necessarily needs to be followed up, or again, that could be a debatable point. But I think the key thing is, if you're going to write something in a report, put yourself in the position of the person receiving the report, and don't leave them with a whole bunch of questions to say, what do I do with that piece of information? Because then they will get over-investigated, and we will significantly increase the burden to the patient, number one, but the healthcare system, number two. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Very nice. Thank you for that. Um, that was fantastic. And um, we will move on to the next presentation by Dr. Ron Carlsberg, um, which is perhaps one of the more important ones because it has to do uh, with finances. Did anybody go out and buy a scanner after Dan recommended it? <laughs> you may want to listen to this first. Um, we did. We did that in um, 2005. We're a 15-member cardiology group. We're in between UCLA and Cedars, but we're totally independent. We have our own foundation. And to provide the best outcomes and quality of care, a cardiac CT center must remain financially viable. And it's a challenging proposition, both in the outpatient and inpatient arena. Let's talk about the hospital first. I think most of you are probably in the hospital setting. I, we'd be aware of the myth of a nonprofit status. Quality and the business of medicine are connected, and to stay viable, we have to follow Sutton's law. And for those of you that don't know, 
Sutton was a bank robber in the last century, and he was asked, why does he rob banks? Because that's where the money is. So unless your program is financially solvent, you're not going to be able to provide quality care. Hospital payments, very challenging. I think it's a misunderstanding, especially from the referring doctors. While, the, the, while you're doing the study, certainly you'll be able to get our uh, work units. But the hospital for imaging, it's a value-added proposition. Medicare pays by DRGs, private insurance number of days. There's no additional uh, payment for imaging in an inpatient center. So the value proposition is to reduce utilization or delays, and that means implementing the robust evidence base that we have, which we're not going to go over today. Hospital-based imaging has a higher cost and higher reimbursement, so there's a big incentive from third-party carriers to refer to outpatient centers. So there is a right time now for a cardiac CT program. So what's essential? The first is a radiology-cardiology partnership. Can't happen without it. And the two have to get along. Programs that don't have that don't have any volume. Your outpatient center should offer full CT services, calcium scores, non-cardiac, lung screening indicated, and you should have a cash um, uh, 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 sheet for reimbursement as well. You must have a relationship with interventional cardiologists. FFRCT has been helpful. Otherwise, these patients get to the cath lab inappropriately. You have to have community visibility, research conferences, social media. But the key is service to the referring doctor, quality studies, timely reports, usually embedded with images, ease of scheduling. And of course, the patient uh, experience sec separates the winners from the losers. Patient preparation, review the images with the patient. We do that all the time. It enhances treatment compliance. We actually serve um, refreshments when we do that. Certification, physicians, level two or three, must be board certified. Now in 2021, formal code four CT uh, requirements will be uh, there. That means two months of dedicated training. You can get it after fellowship, but the days of an easy pathway are gone. Cardiac CT labs, there are three institutions that do it. One is here, IACCT does most of the outpatient labs. ACR, the hospitals, um, the radiology centers, and um, then joint commission uh, is the other one. So prior authorization, actually when first asked, they asked me to talk about this. It's, it's a critical area and it varies uh, across inpatient and outpatient regions. It's dominated by the benefit managers uh, shown up here on the right which contract to payers. Some payers have no requirements to use denials. For example, Medicare uh, removed any barriers to cardiac CT, so in California, the, the third-party payers also do that. So there's almost no prior authorization, but they do use denials. They may ask for records and they can deny afterwards. But even if you get authorization, it's different than payment. When you have authorization, the process starts with a web or phone call, you talk to a nurse, and uh, this whole process is marketed by these benefit providers to stop unnecessary costly testing, improve quality. Really, it's used uh, as a tool to cut expenses. And for, for us physicians, it's a drain on time and resources. Now, some carriers have actually removed authorization if FFRCT is available. So if you have that program in place, there's no authorization for CT. When I spoke to these benefit managers, um, I can go back. How do I go back? <laughs> Left button. Left button. I got it. Okay. They indicated to me that the major reason, uh, the major reason for uh, uh, having to have a peer-to-peer -peer is misinformation. Also, have reasonable cash prices. Patients will actually pay if they understand. Cash fees are often less than the deductible or the copay in an emergency room visit. So what about uh, Medicare? Medicare is uh, jumping on the bandwagon. They're going to have this program called PAMS. You're going to have to consult a qualified uh, website to uh, screen for appropriate use. The goal is to increase the rate of appropriate imaging, CT, spec, and MR. It starts uh, in January 2020 across the country for Medicare. Uh, it's going to be tested for a year and then goes fully implemented 2021. Claims that fail will not be paid. When I spoke to the uh, benefit manager, no savings, more work, disaster, 
they think the program is going to be delayed. So nuts and bolts, expenses and income. If you buy a brand new uh, camera, 250000 you can get a used camera for as low as $150,000. Uh, and they have brand new cameras for $70,000. The 64-slice platform, still stable. You want to have modifications mainly for uh, radiation reduction. Salaries, you need two or three people. Uh, CT technologists, nurse secretaries. Maintenance after that first year is 100000 Rent. Uh, where we are rather expensive, and you have taxes, marketing, administration, another 150,000. So your center is going to run somewhere between 700,000 and a million, and if you have uh, older equipment or after five to six years, you're going to be looking at 500 to 750, a very common number. Well, here's the income. Uh, if you're going to perform only cardiac CT, Medicare now pays only $430, and the expenses, um, are approximately 500 to a million if we assume that. So to break even, depending on which equipment you buy, you have to do four to nine Medicare cardiac CTs a day to break even, or 1,000 to 2,000 studies per year. Very few centers do 1,000 to 2,000 studies per year. But keep in mind, uh, most centers perform more than just cardiac CT. They have uh, sources of income greater uh, than just Medicare. And you have to carefully manage all of these variables and again, the cash uh, studies help a lot. Major competitor, of course, and this was an astonishing slide. I checked it three times, and I was afraid to even show it. Medicare database for spec versus CT. Nearly 2 million spec in Medicare and 100,000 CTs. I mean, I found that absolutely phenomenal. And. Uh, how do you explain um, that? Well, part of that is the infrastructure that's in place and also the very meager reimbursement. Uh, the paltry reimbursement for CT is a great disincentive for medical centers and uh, also for private care in your own hospital, um, and especially when the cardiology community is more dependent on the economics of spec income, which is not uncommon in a practice to represent 10 or 20 percent of the income, so it's a big challenge. The biggest impact that we saw in our practice was a 50 percent reduction in, in, in invasive coronary angiography that we reported 10 years ago. I had a lot of trouble getting this published, and uh, nobody really believed it. It took another 10 years to come to pass, and what was the reason that our center had that? Well, we had uh, CT engaged and uh, cardiologist. So unless you have the stakeholders engaged in the technology and you have multiple chains of people looking at these studies, reporting is so important in this regard, oh, we'll just go to the cath lab. But you, now 10 years later, with the help of FFRCT, this uh, study is now reproduced that you can reduce cath volume average with proper CT and FFRCT by over 50%. And we did that without changing the amount of intervention. So we got the right patient to the cath lab. So in summary, one must maintain a high volume, a referral center, you need volume. You have to integrate into a high, pract a high volume practice, optimally with, with reimbursement greater than Medicare. If you're dependent on Medicare, it's gonna be a problem. Implement the cardiac CT evidence base, that's especially in the hospital, to work with your administrators. I have to offer full CT services as an independent center. You can't make by just on cardiology. Half of our work is inside of uh, non-cardiac. And uh, really assist the SCCT and the advocacy groups that we have to obtain enhanced reimbursement and recommend uh, and implement all these great recommendations from this nuts and bolts center. So it is a business. Um, and, and on behalf of our research institute, our training program, I just thank you for the opportunity. These are happy patients. That, which, that's what you need to do. And word of mouth is amazing. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that. And if uh, that has sparked your interest, we have a dedicated advocacy session uh, in Laurel A and D, which is on the other side. Um, at 5 o'clock today. Um, that's a terrific session. I can only recommend it. Um, and with that, we'll move to our uh, last speaker, Dr. Mark Rabat, who will tell us about how to get a CTFFR program going.
thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. I was given the topic of starting a CTFFR program, what are the steps for successful implementation? So for the purposes of this particular talk, I'll be focusing on HeartFlow FFR CT as it's the only FDA approved and commercially available uh, CT-derived FFR uh, analysis. So the first step for successful implementation is to develop a solid project team, which begins with a physician champion to understand relevant knowledge and understanding to be able to drive the project and answer any clinical queries. And it starts with the understanding of the value of coronary CTA. So CT's excellent sensitivity, negative predictive value, um, uh, excellent warranty period, its prognostication and more contemporary clinical trial data, um, uh, such as Scott Hart and others, suggesting that there's a reduction in hard clinical outcomes such as myocardial infarction compared to standard of care. And then to understand the value of FFRCT, where it increases its specificity, uh, the positive predictive value, rates of unnecessary angiograms, uh, cath demonstrating non-obstructive disease, and, and more contemporary uh, data from advance and others suggesting that individuals with abnormal FFRCTs um, have worse cardiovascular mortality and myocardial infarction compared to those with normal FFRCT. And this physician sh should also serve as an advocate for our patients uh, and to present all this data to senior leadership. The next important project team member is a business manager to help assess the financial viability of the program, to drive the formulation of a business case, and help to demonstrate the cost savings achieved. Um, they can help establishing the target market. Are you going to be targeting physicians and, and uh, patients within your health system, outside your health system, both? They can also help identify uh, high referral physicians to um, functional stress testing or straight to cath, and you can target them first. The next team member is a, a IT manager uh, to assist with setup phase of the DICOM data transfer so that all PHI is securely transferred. Um, and as you heard in the last talk, the value of having an interventional cardiologist who may wish to be involved to understand the wider impact on their service. So for example, I've had many patients now, uh, based off of their anatomy alone on their CTA, were um, diagnosed with obstructive triple vessel disease, but after performing the FFRCT, um, they uh, indeed were found to have single vessel, functionally significant um, uh, lesions, and the other two epicardial vessels were non-flow limiting, so they were downgraded uh, from a coronary artery bypass surgery to a single stent, um, to their LAD, for example. So we're moving beyond does a patient need a cath or not, but we're also guiding revascularization strategies. Um, you know, so there's also some exciting data with virtual stents um, to help predict outcomes of revascularization. And the whole heart team concept really came to fruition a few years ago um, with the uh, achievement of two particular cardiovascular therapeutics, one being structural heart interventions with TAVRs, as well as um, complex coronary artery disease assessment with a syntax score. And I think that a, a similar heart team approach should be applied for those undergoing FFRCT. So who's an appropriate candidate? Those that are stable, symptomatic with suspected coronary artery disease shouldn't be done in, you know, toxic looking patients, unstable, positive biomarkers, non-STEMI STEMIs. Those are not the best patients suited for the technology. Um, currently not approved for stented vessels or bypass graft. Now I will say, um, if you have a patient, let's say with a LAD stent, and you were concerned about um, intermediate lesions in the CERC or RCA, you can still send off that scan for analysis. They'll be able to provide you with the FFR values for those um, non-stented vessels, but the stented LAD would be grayed out. Um, so it is challenging in uncontrolled elevated heart rates. So if you've got patients with dysrhythmias, AFib, rapid ventricular response, those aren't the, the best candidates for the technology. So other tips for adoption, ensure IT compatibility that's been established. So at my particular institution, um, it, it, it's really nice and easy for the physicians. So from the workstation, there's a node with uh, one click of a button. After we identify the intermediate lesion, it gets sent off securely, anonymized to the cloud, and sent back to us where it's de-anonymized uh, to establish patient selection criteria to ensure that it's used appropriately. So we know from contemporary clinical trials that many patients that have low 
probability of CAD may not need any testing at all. So once you've identified the intermediate to high probability of CAD where a CT may be appropriate, um, those are probably best suited for the technology. And if the CT is negative, as we said, you're pretty much done. You don't really need the functional information. So it shouldn't be done in patients without any atherosclerosis. You do need a 64 slice scanner or above, and you should follow the guidelines endorsed from the SACT for image acquisition. Uh, to identify the desired format for receiving the return data for FFRCT. So uh, at our institution, we have a dedicated um, individual. Once we get the results, um, they upload the color-coded PDF to our EMR. Um, what's nice is that it's linked to the CTA report. You could also copy and paste color-coded images to your clinic note, uh, which I find really helpful for referring physicians so they don't have to be fishing throughout the EMR. It's all in one place with my impression and plan. Um, you can also use the interactive model, which uh, you can access from your smartphone or from an iPad or like device. Uh, I find that really helpful when talking to patients. Um, and it's very tangible for them when they see their prox LED lesion, for example, and the delta gradient of color change across that lesion. Um, they also perform a quality assessment. Um, so this is a very challenging CTA with motion and misregistration artifact. Um, I found that a lot of my colleagues who adopted the technology have felt that their CT image uh, quality has improved. Um, they work with your team, your technologist. Uh, they have tips and tricks um, to perhaps, you know, uh, to recon systolic phases if they are required and reascend those images, um, to perform iterative reconstructions, to per perform further ECG editing or alter the filters. It's also important to educate the community. It is a new technology, and many physicians are not uh, up to speed with what FFR is, what CT-derived FFR is, so these are some educational opportunities that I've um, used uh, over the years, medicine grand rounds, cardiology grand rounds, uh, primary care physician medical director meetings. I felt that targeting the PCPs has been very high yield. And after all, they're the ones that are oftentimes seeing these patients with new onset symptoms suggestive of coronary artery disease without prior revascularization. Um, I've also found effective circling back to them. So, you know, basically, remember Mr. Jones that you sent? You were concerned about CD? Well, um, you were right. They had an intermediate lesion that was functionally relevant. You know, we vascularized and now they're feeling better. That extra touch goes a long way in improving your referral base and continuing the patients um, coming in. Uh, also approaching hospitalists as well as educational dinners for both physicians within your community and outside your health system. Here are some examples of patient outreach. So at my particular university, um, we have a medical newsletter that uh, reaches 5,000 or so um, you know, physicians and patients throughout our, our, our region. Um, when we rolled out our program, um, it was highlighted as a cover story. Um, one of our, our, in fact, our first patient who ever underwent the technology was a great story, uh, former Major League Baseball player. Um, you know, he used to play for the Royals, now retired, plays professional softball, inducted in the Softball Hall of Fame. He couldn't run to third base anymore. And uh, his PCP ordered a stress test and um, had great functional capacity and the stress echo was unremarkable. Um, when I was talking to him, we ordered a CT. He had two intermediate lesions in his LAD uh, and CERC. FFRs were positive, revascularized, and he felt great. So we talked to the patient. Uh, he was okay with sharing the story. So we went ahead and performed a video, uh, posted it on our university website, YouTube, other social media outlets. Um, the Chicago Medical Society has a, a Chicago Medicine magazine that we recently wrote a commentary on. So all of this adds up and again, increasing your referral base for um, the technology. Now, you've got your project team rolling. Um, you're, you're scanning patients. You're sending those intermediate lesions. You're getting these color-coded 3D models back, and you're saying, well, how do I interpret this? Uh, so we put this paper together a couple years ago, published in JCCT, um, on how to interpret FFRCT in clinical practice. A few things we highlighted were the science and background of fractional flow reserve. Uh, we defined significant FFR values and some suggestions for reporting. Uh, it's variable depending on where you practice. Some addend the CTA report once they get the FFR results back. At our particular institution, we integrate the FFR analysis with the CT. I found that to be uh, really effective. And now with the turnaround time, coming down um, within a few hours, it's not much of an issue to wait uh, to integrate the analysis. 
And um, it's important in, to demonstrate the benefits of adoption to assess various metrics before and after implementation. Indeed, you may see that the number of unnecessary ICAs uh, going down, uh, the number of ICA showing non-obstructive disease going down, uh, the ICA to PCI ratios going up, and that should resonate with any interventionalists in the room, um, as well as outcome data, costs, um, image quality, and, uh, and, and radiation exposure. So all important metrics. So my journey with uh, FFRCT began about six years ago. This was before FDA approval. This was before reimbursement. I just thought it was the right thing to do. Um, I saw the limitation of our current standard of care practice for CAD diagnosis. Um, and if you fast forward six years, and today you ask me, would you do the same thing? My answer would be yes. So I'll stop there and happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Robot. So that concludes our session. Unfortunately, we are out of time. I just want to take a second to thank our incredible speakers for sharing their expertise in the nuts and bolts of starting a cardiac CT program. For the questions that were submitted through the SECT application, I would like to ask our um, panelists to stay for a few minutes afterwards to take questions from the audience. All right, thank you very much.